All right, welcome everyone to the RSP Film Room. It's been a little while, um, been a little busy on a publication, um, but I am most pleased to have one Fran Duffy joining me today. Fran does work as a video content manager and TV web producer, and he is the former football video web coordinator for Temple. He, you can hear him on the Ross Tucker Show on quite a regular basis. Um, does great, 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 great work working with the Philadelphia Eagles. And uh, Fran, very, very pleased to have you on the show. Welcome. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. I'm uh, happy to be joined. Uh, happy to join you. It's been too long. Yeah, it has. It has. And one of the things that. Uh, you know, one of the things that we're going to be doing today is we're going to get a chance to look at a player on the defensive side of the ball, as many of you know who follow the RSP film room on a regular basis. Um, I tend to lean more towards the offensive side of the football, but it's always fun when we get a chance to look at a prospect um, on the defensive side of things. And today, the guy that we're going to be taking a look at is from Ohio, which is Terrell Basham. And Fran, tell me why you chose Terrell Basham. What is it about him that's in, that interests you? And a little bit about what you think we're going to see today. You know, I think one of the reasons why I wanted to look at Batchelm was because obviously we know it's a, it's a pretty good edge rusher class, and there are a lot of really talented players at the top of this draft. Obviously, it starts with Miles Garrett, and you go right down the list of Derek Barnett and Charles Harris and Carl Lawson and all these guys from the SEC and Pac-12. But then you get to Terrell Basham, and, and I didn't know much about him before I went into studying him before the senior ball. And, I was really surprised by what I saw, not just on tape, but then also in person down there in Mobile as a guy that has versatility, the ability to line up at both left end and right end, which is not common uh, for the for guys coming out of college to be able to do it efficiently from both out of a two-point stance and a three-point stance. And also just his pass rush plan. It's not as advanced as, say, a guy like Charles Harris, but I think that he knows how to attack offensive tackles in a lot of different ways, had a chance to talk with him down there in Mobile, and, and really we had a nice long discussion about that exact topic. So uh, certainly a guy that I can appreciate from the mental side of the game, but then also I think he's got some physical tools as well that he was able to put on display out of the combine. So you've got a guy that really has kind of helped himself every step along the way. He had good tape. He had a good week of practice down there in Mobile and then followed that up with a good performance in the combine. So a guy that really I think has helped himself in what is really a really strong position in the edge rusher class. That's a great explanation of what we're going to be looking at ahead here. And I'm excited about that. So for those of you who are new to the RSP film room, just to give you a quick idea, it's just two guys watching film. We're going to study a guy's tape based off of some cut-ups that we found on um, Draft Breakdown. Um, who does you know wonderful work for the draft community on the internet, social media, and fans in general. So thank you guys for doing the tireless work that you do to, to piece these cut-ups together so that we can do work like this. And then um, we're just going to look at this and comment about what we see. We'll look at things in slow motion. We'll take a look at things at a variety of speeds and um, just talk about what we see from the standpoint of technique, X's and O's, um, projection, and whatever that we tend to look at when it comes to studying players from this standpoint. So we're going to get started, but the first thing that Fran wanted to show us is actually from a, a really well done Senior Bowl recap that the, that the Senior Bowl crew did um, down in Mobile. So we're going to take a look at that, and I'm going to pull that up in a minute and make sure that Fran and I can look at it. Who won? All right, so let's pull this up. We're going to take a look at a couple of drills, I understand, um, from what you're showing here. So let's go ahead and I'm going to put this at half speed for right now just for video quality, see if wow. we can look at it from here and we can turn down Phil Savage's voice in slow motion. We don't. He, I'm sure he would appreciate that. So, And right away, okay. So so really what, really what stood out to me here is, uh, and you can kind of see just the way that he's able to set up that bull rush. He gets Adam Viznawati, the tackle from Pitt, really to kind of open up his chest. And you see just that small hesitation from Bizawadi. It's not a great job by the tackle, but it's a really good job by Basham of forcing him into that position. He oversets, and then he gives him that little bit of stutter step as he comes off the ball, and then he just explodes into his chest, and you see the penetration there off the bull rush. And that, those are the kind of things, talking to him, that he knows that he would watch some of these tackles that he would go up against, and he knew who was prone to kind of opening up her chest, who was prone to oversetting, who was prone to short setting that he knew he could get onto the outside shoulder. So uh, those were, that was one of the things that really stood out to me. And he did this pretty much all week. They picked this one clip 
uh, in their recap, but it really stood out to me as something that I saw consistently from him, uh, not just down there in Mobile, but also on tape. Nice. Let's take a look at the next one here, too. All right, now we're going to get him from the opposite end. Yeah, and he's able to push that man back pretty pretty yep. fast. I mean, good hand position right in the chest, and then... And if I'm not mistaken, that looks like it's Zach Banner. Yeah. And that's a 380-pound that's man right there. Uh, and, and Basham goes about 255, I think is what he was listed at down there in Mobile. He put on about 12 pounds before the combine. But uh, the, you see that ability to play with good pad level, with good hand placement. You see the leg drive on contact, his feet don't stop, and he's able to push a, a bigger man out into the back, into the pocket because of that technique. Yeah, and that's such a great use of context, especially with this type of drill, because, you know, some of the important things that we look for when we're studying tape is not only just the quality, overall quality of the opponent, but using that opponent as, as really context for what that player is capable of doing and being able to look at someone at that level of weight and strength that they possess to be able to see how a guy, you know, obviously, you know, a good 60, 70, 80 pounds lighter, what he can do to him yep. is a very telling yep. thing. That's the, that's the good thing about when you see some of these guys go speed to power, it's not necessarily the big 270 pound defensive ends are able to do that. I mean, how many times have we seen Dwight Freedy win on a speed to power on a plane bull rush? because he's able to get those tackles to overset. And then he knows at that point, that's when he's got him. And, that, and that's really the big thing is if you've got the ability to threaten the outside shoulder as a defensive end or as an ed edge rusher, you know you've got the ability then to win inside. And whether it's with a spin move, whether it's with a swim inside, or if you go speed to power like Bastion did on these first two plays, uh, you know you can win that way. And, and that's really what it's all about as a pass rusher. Have that go-to move and then also have a really reliable counter off of now, that's a great point. I love that you bring up Freeney. I mean, you could bring up Freeney. You could bring up Robert Mathis and his career. Dwight, you know, Elvis Doomerville even, you know, in terms yep. of what, what they have to offer because of that size. So it's it's a wonderful point that you bring up here. We're going to now look, move on. We're going to look at a couple of um, games, uh, highlights from a couple of games here of um, – moments that Fran produced for us to, to take a look at from the App State game as well as I believe the Idaho game. So we're going to go ahead and pull that up and take a look at it more from the range of his technique, um, things that we feel like that he's done really well and that should help him make the transition to the NFL as well as things that maybe he needs to work on. And even some things that maybe, you know, for the viewer who's beginning to scout players or maybe even just for the two of us that might be possibly confusing or difficult for any type of person who's doing any scouting to to really get a clear answer about which is common on tape and it's always kind of fun to explore together so we're going to do that right now let's pull up our first tape all right so we're going to pull up this first one which is we're going to have late in the first quarter here we got a second and 10 we got basham on the on the left tackle side here I'm going to watch this in, at about half speed. And this is very similar to that Bisnawati play, the first one we looked at from the senior ball, where you see he kind of delays the rush a little bit. And we'll get to that a little bit later, his, his get off. But the, the big thing you see here is just him understanding what the tackle's doing and just knowing, okay, you know what, I've got this inside shoulder. You watch him attack that inside number, and he doesn't get the sack here, he doesn't get a pressure but he's able to get inside the quarterback's lap uh, as the ball's thrown. It's just an impressive rush there. Yeah, absolutely. And when you can collapse a pocket like that on a consistent basis, even if you're not getting sacks, you're doing damage. You're helping out your team. So that's – Yeah, this, this goes back – both games that we're looking at here are from the 2015 season. And it's funny going and looking at those two games. Cause I, have, I didn't watch them in 2015. Everything that I had seen from him so far had been 2016. And when I had watched him in 2016, I thought he was really good at all of these areas that we're going to talk about. And as I watched all these games, I saw just the improvement that he has made from his junior year to his senior year. Uh, because, you know, we were able to find some examples of some good, but there was a little bit more bad. And we'll get to that a little bit later. But it's good to see him make that jump from his junior year to his senior year. And you see him coming off the field side here from the wide side of the field. He typically, in most of the other clips that we're going to see, he's coming from the short side, the boundary side. 
so that's what's interesting is in that defense, he had played both sides of the formation. Nice. All right, so let's go and look at our next one here. And I believe 432 was the point here, so let's go and pull that up. So familiar here? Looks so, about right. All right, cool. I have a good short-term memory, at least for today. <laughs> All right, so now we're going to get to see him in a little bit of a two-point. Yep. So what I like here is that he works to get outside, and he sees that, the, that his path, his initial path, is taken away. So what he does is he does not get deeper than the quarterback. He keeps his eyes up, and now he's still, ha he's still in front of the quarterback. Because so often you're going to see guys try and ride that out. And that's honestly a lot of tackles now are taught that when that guy drives it outside, you're going to run that hoop with them. And, you know, and if you've got an athletic enough tackle, you're going to be able to do that. Where you're going to run that hoop with them, ride them where he wants to go, and then bury him when he goes to bend and turn the edge. But you see Basham here understanding, you know what, my first line of, of attack here is taken away. I'm going to counter this back inside. Again, no pressure, no, no even a hit, not even a hit here on the quarterback. But I like seeing things like this from a guy uh, consistently. And then we're going to see a couple of those clips where – he does not get deeper than the passer. He's able to keep his eyes up. He's able to then later impact the throw. If, if the coverage had held up, then he would have gotten home. But it, you really like to see that from a young rush. Yeah, this is an astute point here. I know that in past RSP film rooms that I've done with Ryan Riddle, the former defensive end for Cal, we did one on um, Randy Gregory, the, the Nebraska standout who's with the Cowboys. And, how, and one of the things that Ryan noted right away was that Gregory tended to get deeper than the quarterback and just rotate all the way around without giving thought to the fact that maybe he should bring it back inside and bring it back underneath. And this is a really great example of what he was talking about here and what you've astutely pointed out. Yeah, it's, a, it's something that, you know, you, you just get to see from watching a, a lot of the league over and over again is just the idea of, you know, these rushers will take themselves out of the play. Yeah, and so often now you see that with, tackles at the NFL level, like I mentioned, uh, you, you, they, those tackles are taught to ride you out. As soon as you go to go outside, if you, if you expect that coming as an offensive lineman, you're going to get your hands on, get your hands on the backside of that shoulder blade, and then you're just trying to push that into the ground and ride him out where he needs to go. Yeah, and he's coordinated with his hands. You can certainly see even here where he's just swatting down because he's, he's kind of got that, you know, he's got that inside arm kind of almost like he was going to rip upward, but didn't really quite hit that. And then he comes back around. He's able to swat down with that inside arm nicely. He, you know, just seeing someone who, even as someone who's got a decent speed to power transition, someone who's got, you know, some some quickness to be able to at least threaten the outside and some movement, they also have that coordination with their hands, or at least it appears to be that way in the first couple of um, looks that we've that we've seen thus far. Yeah, and it's also worth noting too, Matt, we see him come off the ball in a two-point stance here. He, he does that every once in a while. Uh, and in that defensive scheme, they ask him to drop. Uh, and there were a few plays where I could have shown him dropping as, as a seam defender, as a curl defender. Uh, he'll drop in, in intermediate zone coverage. And, and, you know, obviously he's not the, the greatest athlete in the world in terms of being able to hold his own in space. But uh, he, he does look pretty smooth when he's out there. And he showed that a little bit at the combine as well. So he's got some of that scheme versatility depending on what you're looking for in your edge rushers. Great. And really the recurring theme I'm hearing from you as you're presenting him is this is an intelligent guy who prepares. Yeah, and that was one of my big takeaways after speaking with him down at the senior bowl was uh, just I walked away from that conversation thinking, you know what, this guy gets it as an NFL player, as an edge rusher. He knows what he's doing in terms of preparation during the week and also just understanding his skill set and what he can and can't do. Uh, that was one of the other big things we talked about was just understanding what, what your limitations are physically and then how you can overcome them because everybody's got limitations in the NFL. Yeah, and that's probably one of the most important, I would say one of the most important things I would say even for anybody in life is to understand your strengths and your limitations. The sooner you understand your limitations on a level, the better off you tend to be in terms of being able to maximize what you can do and enlist the aid of others and also know your lane. And sure. and that's a, you know, that's a bit of wisdom that for someone to be 
you know, at this age and have that level of self-awareness about their position when this is a heady time to be like, oh my goodness, I'm about to go pro. And, you know, everyone's telling me how great I am on campus and, you know, and all of these different things that happen at this point to be able to know, look, I know what I can do. I know what I can't do. And that's okay. Um, is a, it, that's a, that's a great sign of maturity. So that, that, I love that point that you brought up there. All right, so let's go ahead and move on. We're going to take a look at the next um, few vids of, um, I believe, at Idaho. Let me pull that one up. One. All right, so we're going to look at one more play of something that's really promising. Full-fledged... I can't hear you, Matt. How about now? There we go. Gotcha. You know, uh, old man here is uh, hitting his uh, hitting his mute button by accident. So <laughs> we're gonna go ahead and uh, start this over from the from the get go here. No All right, here we go. Yep. So we've got him here on the uh, on the right tackle side. Okay, so you get a similar situation as the last one, except this time he's spinning out of it. He goes to win outside. He goes with a nice little chop move where he chops the offensive tackle's hands on the outside. When he sees that's taken away, you see him immediately counter into that swim, or it's that spin rather. Sorry. Yeah. And same, same idea. You don't want to get deep. He feels that he's getting deeper than the than the, than the quarterback, so he chop, he spins his way out of it to get his eyes back on the passer the quarterback scrambles out but again just another example of him not getting deeper than the quarterback and understanding where he is in terms of the rush absolutely it's good situational awareness again and the fact that he's seen in the pocket well enough as he's turning that corner that he can identify that this is now the running back's got the ball and it's time to do something about that as opposed to running himself out of the play yep exactly so yep lots of nice play intelligence that we have going on here um, with our man Terrell Basham. So let's go ahead and move on to the next one. All right, so these are things that uh, Basham needs to work on. We're going to start with the first one here at App State. And this is a first and 10 also on the right-hand side of the, or the right tackle side. So the big thing here, and I mentioned previously, is get off. And you're going to notice at the speed you're playing, you see that he's the last bobcat off, off the ball. Yeah. That's something that's very, very consistent. And probably one of his number one issues is his get off speed. And, you know, you talk with guys like who, who studied the pass rush position, like a Justice Mosqueda. And he actually, we had a great conversation, I think it was about a year ago, uh, where he talked to me about, you know, different reads for those guys coming off the edge. You know, sometimes they're reading the ball, sometimes they're reading the tackle. To me here, though, it just seems like he's just laid out of his stance. And that's a, that's a reaction quickness kind of deal. Uh, I don't know that that's something that can never get corrected. I've asked numerous people, and some say yes, some say no. So it's a little bit of a mixed bag. Um, you know, I, I think when you when you look at it, though, one of the big issues with that is that you see that since he's laid off the ball, that tackle is ready for him as soon as he as soon as he gets out of his stance. The the tackle is able to strike first. He's got his hands inside. Rashad has his hands outside, and immediately he's lost his down. Yeah, especially. He's playing a little bit lighter at this stage in his career. I want to say he was in the 248 range at this point, uh, maybe just under 255. But like I said, he came in at 269 a couple weeks ago in Indianapolis. So uh, he was a little bit lighter at this point. But that get off, that, that can be an issue at times, unless, especially if you're a little bit off of your technique like he is here. Yeah, and imagine if they were running at him at this yeah. stage, you know, and they will be running at him. You know, so it's definitely a, that's definitely a great point. It's funny we had Justice on as well talking about that same thing with um, one Mr. Holmes. I don't remember his first name. Who was a uh, yeah Montana dude. Yep. So so yeah. So that it was the same exact thing that we were talking about there. It's a great point, and it's nice when we have guests on the show 
that are really you, you get to see the the theme of some of the same things that we talk about that are important points you know about these positions and this is definitely one of them so great let's go ahead and move on to the next one here and this next one is a bull rush that we're going to take a look at so yeah. here we go what we got going on here for him all right. all right the bull rush against the tight end from idaho and you see he's laid off the ball again but really the big thing is just the lack of power behind that bull rush he's late with his hands uh the, the tight end is ready for him his hand placement's off here his pad level's high so it's just kind of all over a mess but really just lack of penetration there on the bull rush and now the big thing is is that he has added weight. I mentioned that he was probably closer to 250 at this point. This is his, uh, early in his junior season. We're now, you know, 18 months later, and he's just under 270. So uh, he's put on a put on a few LBs there at this point. But uh, certainly the, the big thing is the get off, and then just the lack of bulk in his lower half, which he has rectified. But certainly something that you want to see, wanted to see transitioning to the NFL is just a little bit stronger, a little bit more powerful. And if you're not that, then you need to be consistent with your technique. And, and we saw that earlier at the senior bowl, that second bull rush against Zach Batter. We don't see it here against the tight end from Idaho. Yeah. And I think what, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to take the luxury of, of, you know, guessing his motivation here, which is probably not the safest thing to do when you're scouting a player. Um, but it's, but it might be kind of fun for entertainment purposes because this was was this this last year this was last year right so to, yeah. yeah so you know you talked about this guy being prepared you talked about preparation and then we're also talking about um you know him having to you know add a little bit more weight and be consistent and part of being mature is being willing to be consistent and disciplined about your consistency so you know, maybe a lesson learned for him has been that because you could look at his play and go, you could imagine him off the side going, oh, I've got a tight end. I'm going to bowl this guy into the backfield, into the quarterback. It's going to be fun. And th when it didn't happen, he was, you know, he, he was way too confident about his ability to do that. Yep. Yeah. And you just see, like I said, the, the, the hand placement's off there. He's a little bit high, a little bit outside. The pad level's poor. You know, just everything right there. That freeze point was perfect where you just you don't see uh, exactly what you want in terms of where he is yeah. in terms of uh, that strike. Yeah, and this is, you know, I mean, I, this is getting a little off the topic, but I think it's worth just to, to mention is this is the reason why teams upset better teams is, you know, I'm not saying that Terrell is actually thinking this, but, you know, when a team feels they are athletically superior and they come in and they say, we are just going to we are going to terrorize this guy. Look at this little guy I'm going to be taking on here. He's nothing. I'm going to, you know, and if the little guy's more technically sound, a little bit more prepared, he's not freaking out over the fact that Terrell's coming up here high and trying to be a great big old guy to come over the top like this and, and intimidate him and stop him. Suddenly, the, a team full of guys like this start making plays, and obviously it didn't happen in this game. But that's this is how this is how better athletes lose oftentimes yep. because of sure. these types of things if they consistently do it over and over again. So it's just it's just a worthwhile point. I just think you know that it kind of made me think of that when you brought this play up. So let's go ahead and look out at the next one here that we got. All right, so now we're going to take a look at a couple of plays that are that might be confusing you know from one level to the other maybe it was something that fran found, found confusing maybe it was something that fran looks at that you know that any that he might figure other people might find confusing who are are studying a player on tape that might be common from there so this is a tackle for a loss that fran posted here so tell us about why is this under the confusing label but really the big thing, you're going to see him, he's on the field side, so the, the top defensive end over the left tackle. And the big thing that you see here is he's going to penetrate inside the B-gap. And one thing you got to be careful of when you see a play like this is, especially from this angle, we're not 100% on the run fit, so we're not 100% that he was responsible for the B-gap. But just watching how he engaged the tackle, I feel like, again, we say it will feel like it may have been he may have been the C-gap defender. So he goes back door here. And whenever I talk with defensive players about this, 
they'll say, yeah, you can go back door, but if you go back door, you better make the play. And, <laughs> yep. and, so he takes, a, he takes a chance here, and he does make this play. It's a tackle for loss in the backfield. It's early in the game. It's a big play uh, against the run. But you just want to be careful. Number one, you don't want to give him too much credit because he may have freelanced a little bit. But number two, you got to make sure that he actually did freelance it. So if you see it from the end zone angle, which we don't have the luxury of here, uh, you can really get a sense of, of the hat placement and really kind of get a better guess, a better feel over whether or not uh, he fit this correctly. But really, the, that, that's the big thing you want to watch is when you see a guy kind of go back door like that, that he through the B gap, and that's that gap between the tackle and guard, whether or not he was actually responsible for that gap or whether he saw an opening and said, you know what, I'm taking it, I'm going to shoot my gun, and I'm going to go after the ball. Yeah, and it's and it's it's fascinating that you bring up the defenders. You know, often will say that if it's there, you, you know, you want to take it, but make sure that you get it. I mean, we we were watching Kyle Van Noy um, one time on this show with uh, Ryan Riddle, and and Ryan brought up this very fact. It's like, hey, look, you if you're in the NFL, you're gonna need to take some chances and be creative with what your responsibility is otherwise you're not going to make big plays um, because everything is usually so well blocked usually guys are so on top everything that if you're not trying to at least make some big plays occasionally and shoot your gun um, you're probably you're you're probably going to have some you're probably not going to be able to make as many plays as you need to but at the same time that's the danger is exactly what you described Fran so it's a it's a fascinating thing so let's go ahead We'll move forward to the next one here, and that's uh, 627. All right. See my little cheat sheet that we got going on here for people with bad memories like myself. Let's see. <laughs> All right. So moving forward. Here we go. We I'm at the top of the screen. So this one was interesting because we talked about his get-off, right, man? You see the late jump here off the ball. But there are times where you have to be careful with this because this is going to be a TE stunt here from the Bobcats. And this may have just been a delayed release here from him out of his stance just to affect the timing of the game up front. And so he lets the tackle penetrate. So TE tackle first, then end. Uh, the tackle penetrates upfield, then the end. And that's Basham from the top of the screen loops back inside. And he may have delayed his get off just a hair there just to, to make sure that the timing was right with the stunt. And that might have been something that they thought, you know what, uh, maybe they had run it a couple times in the game, and they said, you know, maybe just slow that release just a little bit and help that timing out. Yeah, and it turned out to be a very nice play in the way that they timed it because you're you're looking here, you get this more powerful DT on the, on the right tackle, and you've got Basham occupying two, um, two blockers at this stage. And because of that, you get the push, you get the hand in the air, and you get the bad pass. That's what's funny, too. And obviously, it's not him making the play, but you see the, the, the tackle, the, the, the first man in, is actually the one who's able to get his hand up and alter this the trajectory of this throw. And that happens so often that the, the first guy in is supposed to be the, the, the guy who's supposed to be giving himself up. You know, he's the penetrator. He's supposed to set this up for the looper. But so often now, especially if you're a team that runs a lot of stunts up front, you know, the offensive line is trying to account for that, and they're, they're sliding off and trying to pass people off. And sometimes that penetrator will be the one that will make that play. So as long as all four guys are, are getting after it and they're on the same page, you know, th those games can be effective. Yeah, and it's funny because you see Basham kind of recognize this because he consciously says, let me put one hand on the on the center and one on the guard <laughs> and see oh keep that guard from sliding on over to the – to the defensive tackle looping outside so yeah that's a fun play that's a really good one all right let's go ahead and take a look at our, our next few here pulled some of these all right so this last play we're going to take a look at is something that's promising from basham's game and this is a this is a counter that you noticed here against idaho so let's go ahead and pull that up and get this one started sure So really, it's just more of the same, right? And this is something that's why I really wanted to show it again because it's something that you see time and time again with Basham is, again, he tries to win outside. He doesn't get deeper than the quarterback. His eyes are up. And now he's attacking that inside shoulder. He understands that the tackle overset. 
that outside path is taken away. I'm going to counter back inside. He rips his, he rips through the inside shoulder, and now he's chasing the quarterback. And again, he's not making a big play. This isn't a sack fumble. This isn't uh, an impacted throw that results in an interception. But it's little things like this uh, that really kind of separate guys from from each other. Uh, in my mind, at least, when I'm looking at some of these edge rushers. Yeah, and I think it's such a great play to point out because, again, it is. It's the details that matter and in the building blocks of how a player develops. And if you can see a player show steady development, you can see that they get the conceptual aspects of the game and that they're they're taking steps to try and do all the right processes that – that's the great part about good scouting is that you're you're looking at the process, not the end result. And and Fran's done a great job today of being able to show us, you know, from a process-oriented perspective, why Terrell Basham has value to a team and some of the things that he has done throughout his career to get to ready for this next step so that he can begin to transition and why He's an appealing player in many respects and will be for a team because of the fact that he can take these steps and continue to show, you know, conceptual preparation and then execution on the field with it. Um, so, you know, with that in mind, you know, you what do you think about Basham in terms of where you'd like to see him go? What what type of, you know, what type of benefit would he have to a team um, right now? And, you know, where you're looking at him down the road in the next year, two, three years? You know, I think right off the bat, I think he's probably a, a backup defensive end in a 4-3. I do think that he can play 3-4 outside backer. I think he's got enough versatility to be that guy. Uh, we know that ultimately the teams are going to be in their sub package and you're going to see mostly head in the dirt anyway. But ultimately, I think that he's at his best right now, right in year one as a backup defensive end. I think he's got the ability to also, we didn't really talk about his ability to defend the run. I think he's a solid run defender right now, uh, shows the ability to lock out. I think he's overall pretty gap sound uh, and understands his role in the, in the run fit. Really the big thing that I want to see from him overall, I want to see him improve his timing a little bit with his hands as a pass rusher. Because while he does have the ability to win outside and then also win with a counter, I do want to see him improve his timing with his hands a little bit more. And then also, I just want to see him get a little bit bigger, a little bit stronger, and he's done that. So I'm really excited to see how he does transition to the next level. And, I, you know, I think of a, a scheme like a Sean McDermott in Buffalo where uh, it's a 4-3 system, but you're going to see those guys dropping out in zone pressures and be used in a lot of different exotic ways. There were times when Basham uh, was moved around as a joker standing up in the A-gap. He has experience doing that as well. So I think that he can be that guy to start his career. It wouldn't surprise me at all if he does, in fact, turn into a starter down the line. But ultimately, I think if you're looking at him as a starter, I think he'll probably be viewed by most as a starter that's kind of replaceable, more of a, a, a nice role player as opposed to a, you know, a pro bowl player off the edge. But I really like him, and I, I think that he translates really well to the NFL game. That's great. And this was a really informative show, Fran. So if you will, for everyone, inform everyone where they can find you, where you'd like them to find you, and and go from there. So uh, you can follow me on Twitter, at FDuffy3, uh, and I'm on a, a couple podcasts. So you can follow the, uh, the Eagle Eye in the Sky podcast, uh, which is on iTunes, the College Draft podcast that I do with Ross Tucker, also on iTunes, and then the Journey to the Draft podcast. So two draft podcasts an all-22 podcast that I, I always chat with lots of great people, lots of great guests each and every week, and you can check that out uh, all on iTunes. You can just subscribe, and always good for uh, going back and forth with people on Twitter as well. Absolutely, and Fran does fantastic work. And let me just tell you, even if you are not an Eagles fan, you should go check out his draft podcasts because they are fantastic. They're informative. He's got great guests. As you can see here, Fran knows his stuff. So for Fran Duffy, I'm Matt Waldman. Thanks again for joining us in the RSP Film Room. For more RSP Film Rooms, you can check out the YouTube channel, the RSP Film Room, or you can go to my blog at www.mattwaldmanrsp.com and check out the work there. And for Fran, for myself, thanks again, and you guys have a good night.